the idea here though is to talk about um, the basic underlying vocabulary so that when you're talking to somebody about technology, when you're buying a computer, when you're having an argument about how documents are produced, you'll have ha listened or heard some of the basic terms that geeks use in how these things work um, so that you'll understand what we're talking about. We're not going to try to get too geeky and, and if we do, please interrupt uh, and ask us to, to explain a little bit more. Um, the reason behind all of this, and we do this presentation a lot, but usually w when we deal with technology, this is kind of the way we feel, like the astronaut in 2001. We don't really understand the computers and we're not sure we're communicating with them, but we're pretty sure they're going to kill us at some point or another. Uh, and then we feel like really trapped inside this whole technological bubble because there's all this stuff that's going on with technology and we're not really sure um, what some of it means. That all begs the question, why is this even important? Why do we care about all this? This is a quote from an attorney named Craig Ball, who is a, uh, a former plaintiff's attorney over in Texas. He retired from his active practice about three, four years ago and is now uh, spending all of his time as a special master in e-discovery cases uh, because that's become a, a really, a, especially at the federal level, a forefront of motion practice and discovery now is electronic documents. And in addition to that, 40 of the states, including our state, uh, including Texas, um, have local state civil rules which mirror the federal civil rules on electronic discovery. Um, and, and so that means that producing documents uh, electronically uh, becomes uh, very important because as as Craig says in his quote, that's where the evidence is now. This, this, isn't, this isn't a document under the federal rules. If this was created in Word and stored electronically someplace on, a, on an LSBA file server, that electronic document that's on the file server, that's the document under the federal rules and under the Louisiana rules of civil procedure. And if you want to produce the document uh, in discovery, this is not responsive. The printout of the document is not responsive. It's the original of the document electronically that's called the native file. You'll hear that term all the time. So we're going to talk to you about how those native files get created and stored and what, what's going on behind the scenes uh, because that's important for production, for validation, for authentication of these documents. So the components of a computer. We're going to just run through the basic components of a computer, what constitutes the individual parts, and some of these are going to be very important in terms of document authentication as we go through them. Um, the first one is the case. You, you wonder why we're talking about the outside of the computer, but on a desktop computer, this is just something that un unscrews and is removed. It's a skin. It's nothing more than an outer layer. Whereas on a laptop, um, anybody got like a laptop? There's one sitting on the desk there. Of course, the, the case doesn't come off. It's all one modular piece. On a desktop, you plug your printer in, you plug your uh, monitor in, you might plug your CD-ROM player in, but on a laptop, that's all included, okay? So it, it's important on a desktop that this can come off because you can access the components. There are one or two laptops where you can do that, uh, a couple of Dells and an HP, but all Macintosh computers are essentially modular. You can't open them up and get at them. So let's take a look underneath and see what some of the parts are. The, the basic part that sits inside the desktop computer is called the motherboard. You can see it's a big circuit board. And this is basically everything is being plugged into this in one way or another. On the right hand side you can see some vertical slots. Those slots take even smaller boards which plug into them and, and perform several different functions. We'll talk about those. Down on the lower left you can see some white plugs um, that they stick out through the case. That's where your monitor plugs in. That's where your printer plugs in. The ones on the right there are for headphones or ear jacks, speakers, um, USB ports, your network plugs. Everything plugs in and you can see they're sitting directly into the motherboard. So the signal is going from that external plug directly in. And then that big square thing in the orange uh, that's surrounded by that orange plastic piece there, that's where the, the chip uh, sits. Uh, its technical term is the central processing unit or the CPU. You'll hear, hear it referred to as a chip or sometimes more commonly now as a core. You'll hear 
a reference to dual core machines. And could you just flip back to that one sec? Um, sometimes instead of having one chip right there and a dual core machine, there'll be two. Um, and the idea now is to make things work faster by having two computer chips and they split up the duties, if you will, and some of them are doing uh, one part of the functions and some of them are doing others so that things can go faster. Um, the biggest or the most commonly known example to this is really uh, a couple years ago there was a, a lot of news about the chess champion who was beaten by the computer, Watson, the IBM computer. Well, Watson wasn't really a computer. It was the, 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 the match was fixed, if you will. There were, Watson was really about 800 chips multiple cores that IBM had cobbled together and what they had done was on each one of the individual chips they had loaded all the games of a specific grandmaster okay so that when this guy made his move the computers would all start processing you know how would Boris Spassky re do this how would Bobby Fischer reply to this each chip would analyze the game in terms of a, 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 an old grandmaster some of them going back over a hundred years so he was really playing like 800 guys not one computer. Um, but that's how dual core machines will work, is to split up what's going on, split up the processing, so things happen faster and faster and faster. And really, I mean, every device now has one of these. Your, your phone has it, your tablet. Um, I mean, really, the most common that we're seeing now, and, and this does change, but it's really the Intel, Pentium i3, i5, and i7. Um, this can also, it's interesting, but about five years ago, uh, Mac switched from the power PC to the Intel chip, and when they did that, they were able to run Windows on them. Um, so that this chip really can affect a lot of stuff. The, like what AMD makes another chip, they're usually not as or known as good. The Intel probably are the, the best ones. In Intel is definitely the Cadillac of chip manufacturing. Five or six years ago, that might have made a big difference because they'd be substantially more uh, expensive, 30, 40 percent more expensive. Now, like everything else in the computer world, chip manufacturing's uh, become much more automated and, and the prices are down. So AMD used to, if you went to a, like a, a, a Best Buy and looked at computers, you'd see the Dells and the HPs and they'd all have Intel chips. Then there'd be some clones or no-name computers and they might have an AMD chip and they'd be like 30 percent cheaper because of that. But now that difference has really shrunk. Uh, AMD is a good chip, it just isn't, you know, it's not quite the top of the line, but at the price point you're paying today, you might as well get an Intel chip. There's no significant difference. Okay, the other thing that you hear about in terms of computers is RAM. And uh, RAM, you can see this is a small card, of, of an electronic card. S these plug into those white slots that were on the right-hand side of the motherboard, okay? RAM stands for Random Access Memory. This is really, really important because this memory is the temporary memory that allows the computers to do four or five different things at once. You can have your email open and a Word document open and a spreadsheet open and the internet open. That's because the RAM is running all of these things independently in independent temporary memory. So the more RAM you have, the more things you can do simultaneously uh, and efficiently. Uh, and RAM, large amounts of RAM, can even make up for an older chip. So sometimes if you have an old computer, especially a desktop that you can open up, you can pull these old cards out and buy new ones with more RAM and put them in and it'll make the computer uh, work faster. Uh, most computers are going to come with, what, four or eight gigabytes of RAM. That's, we'll talk about what a gigabyte is in a second, but for purposes of this discussion, it's just a unit of measurement. Right. The bottom line is get as much as you can. If you can get 16 gigabytes of RAM or 24 gigabytes of RAM, it's cheap. It's just a question of whether the machine can accept larger amounts and it might increase the price of the machine by 50. In laptops, it's going to be pretty set. You know, an individual laptop's going to come with a certain amount of RAM, and that's pretty much what you got. There's not much you can do to increase that. Some of, some of the Dells you can replace, the Macs you definitely can't. Just to add to this, this conversation real quick, going back to the, to the CPU, um, about four years ago when you bought a computer, it was common that you had a 32-bit architecture, and that 32-bit limited you to four gigs of RAM. Now, everything that you buy or you should buy is going to be a 64-bit, 
chip. So you want like 64-bit Windows, and that allows you to have as much RAM as you can process. Okay, so now we're getting super geeky. This is like like crazy. So 32 bad, 64 is good. Um, uh, the one thing I'd say is if you've got a computer that's a little slow, and yeah, this that was a little technical here, and so how do you find out? There's a website, it's called crucial.com. So the word crucial, then .com. If you go to that website, it's got a tool on it that will download on your computer. It will tell you how much RAM you have, and it will tell you how much you can buy to add to that. And usually that's like $50. So you could double the speed of your computer for 50 bucks. And it's, it's on, on, again, on a desktop, it's really easy to put in. On a, maybe like a Dell Latitude, it, it'll be a little more difficult, but it can still be done. You might have to take it to like Best Buy or something like that. Um, and on like the Mac, when you buy it, I mean, they glue those that stuff in there so it's impossible to replace. So here's a simple explanation. And the reason we say this is because, again, you may go to the store and there's a computer for like 200 bucks. And you're going, well, why? Well, why don't I buy the $200 computer instead of the $600 computer? But it might say on it, it's 32-bit architecture on the chip, okay? Think of, think of those numbers, 32 bits and 64 bit, as lanes in a highway. Uh, a bit is the smallest piece of magnetic storage on the computer, and so a 32 bit chip is a 32 lane highway. It can process or move all of that stuff through 32 lanes. 64 bit chip is a 64 lane highway. It can double the amount of information it's processing or moving at the same time, so twice as fast. So you might see what seems to be a really good deal on a computer, but it says it's a 32-bit chip. What they're doing is trying to clear out the old stuff. Um, now, that may still be good for a backup computer or something, but th that's really why we're having these discussions is to, is to, to talk about it. And remember, uh, sometimes you'll get a 64-bit chip, but it'll be dual core, so you've got two 64-lane highways to throw this stuff for, through. So that combination of the chip and the RAM will really translate to speed how fast the computer is going to work. Now you said like if I, this is useful if I open up multiple stuff. Is any data, like if I shut off the computer, what happens to the Word document I had open that was in RAM? Can I pull data out of that? No. Now, some computers, and this may have happened to you, the programs are set up to create a temporary file. So if the computer crashes, you turn it back on, you get a message that says, we've saved that file that you were working on, do you want to reopen it? Do you want to go back to it? Um, what it did was take it out of the RAM when the, when the thing crashed and dumped it into the, onto the hard drive. And, and so now we'll talk about that. This is where the data is really stored on a computer. It's stored on the hard drive. And there are two types of hard drives. Um, the one on the right is the most common. It's the technology we've been using for years and years now. It's a magnetic storage system. It's actually electromagnetic. Um, that round part is the disk. You'll hear people talk about, I got a disk or a hard drive. That's what it is. It's a disk like a record, like an old 33 and a third record. It's about this big and it spins around. And then there's an arm that hovers above it. It doesn't touch it the way a record needle does. It hovers just above it and sends an electromagnetic spark, which registers on the disk and saves things magnetically. So the mag it's a magnetic storage system. The disk is spinning, the arm is sending a signal, almost like a light bulb with the two filaments and there's an electric spark between the, between the filaments that's the light. This is doing the same thing with an electromagnetic star. And so when it does that, every time it sends a charge, it's, a, it's called a bit. It's, it's making what's called a, a, a bit stamp onto the disk itself and saving it magnetically. Now, there's a couple things, and this is what's important for getting at documents and retrieving documents. Remember, the disk is spinning, and the arm is sending the current, OK? It's not storing stuff linearly the way a file cabinet is. So you open up a file cabinet, you get a red well with your case, and there's a file folder with all the correspondence and the pleadings and so forth, OK? The disk is storing that stuff randomly as the disk spins, OK? And it has a file that it uses. It keeps track of that spinning and where the data is. Um, and it, that is called the file allocation table, or the FAT, okay? That's the key to getting data back on, on, uh, off of the disk. When you bring up your, your directory and say, I want, I scrolled on, oh, there's that letter that Tom sent to, to Craig, hit the enter key, retrieve that, it's going to the FAT to find out, hey, where are all the pieces of that around the disk 
that I had, and it's pulling them back together and pulling them up on the screen for you, okay? So two things can happen. One, if there's a power surge or you drop the computer, the disk itself can be harmed, right, because it's a mechanical device. Um, so the disk can be scored or power surge can, can send a, a, a current across it that wipes out stuff or makes uh, pieces of the disk unable to store the data. Um, or the file table itself, the fat can become corrupt. So the computer has sort of early onset Alzheimer's. It knows there's stuff out there, but it can't quite find it. Um, so there's lots of ways that this can be damaged. This is where forensics experts come in because typically that data, even when something like that happens, is retrievable. Remember, it's being stored magnetically. It's simply a question of going in and finding where all those bits are and reassembling them. There are, pro there are programs that will do that, and that's what forensic scientists do. Um, they get paid a lot of money to do it, but usually they can recover just about anything, no matter how bad the computer's been damaged. Um, I've worked with a forensics company for several years out of Tulsa, and they have some DOD contracts. They were actually given some computers uh, that came back from Afghanistan. They were LK DA computers that had been uh, hit by a bunker blaster bombs. They retrieved them from a bunker and they were able to get data off those computers. It was absolutely astonishing. The, um, other, the other thing that's important, sorry, just real quick, when you delete a file, remember we get the disk spinning in the file allocation table, the file doesn't get deleted. The file isn't being wiped off the computer. The computer is going in, the delete key should really say, go to the file allocation table, change the name of this file, and move the bits to some empty space where they're not needed, and physically delete them only when we fill up the disk and need that space. Well, of course, that's all too big to put on a little computer key, so they say delete. But delete does not mean delete, okay? It's still there, it's just been renamed. Well, forensics guys can also go in and find that stuff. Um, pretty easily. Um, that, that's kind of a no-brainer for them. It, they know it's there. It's just been renamed. They, they got to go into the fat and crack the code for what it was named. Very simple process for them. So the whole point is when somebody tells you, oh, those documents are gone, those documents have been deleted or destroyed or the disk has been formatted, not necessarily so. In fact, probably not so at all. Probably an 80% chance if it's important enough in whatever case you're on, to get that information, you can get a forensics person to do that. Expensive, those guys make a whole lot of money. I should have been a forensic scientist. Um, I mean, four or $500 an hour is not uncommon for them to do this, um, but they can get the data. So that's, a, that's the sort of device that we store data with now. Um, the one on the left. Well, I just want to go back and add yeah. one thing real quick. I mean, most commonly, if you're not doing this for a forensics collection, You've been working on your desktop or laptop. You might have dropped your laptop, and you turn it on, and you'll hear like click, 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 mm -hmm. and it won't work. I mean, that basically means that somehow the needle has been broken. Yep. Um, but that's another thing where you can pull that hard drive out, and you can send it to someone, and they can pull all the data back. So you haven't really lost all your data if your computer can't start. Um, the other thing I'll bring up here is what I do and what I recommend. I mean, if you're giving a computer away to someone, you can pull this disk out and put it in your closet somewhere and just keep it there and then give them the rest of the computer. But again, because of what you just said, I would not be giving a computer, even if I formatted the hard drive, to anyone. And, and to even add to that, this is something that you really don't think about. Um, but I remember reading somewhere there's more internet connected devices now than there are human beings on this planet. Hmm. So um, th these sort of disks are in copy machines. So you don't think about that, but when you're like giving away your copy machine or you're replacing it with a new one, there's a hard drive in there, and it's basically keeping track of the documents that you scanned, got faxed in, and stuff like that. So you got to pull that too. And there's been cases where someone's gotten one of these copy machines and they've just like pulled the hard drive out, plugged it in, yep. and like pulled all the data off of it. Yep. So it's just it's not computers. It's you got to think about what has a hard drive. Right. So, why is the picture on the left different? This is what's called a solid state drive, and you're going to start to hear 
this name, especially when you go to buy a computer? Does it have a solid state drive? Or if, you're, if you get a Mac Air, any computer that's super thin, um, or tablets or cell phones. Obviously, we don't have a big spinning hard drive inside of these things. What are we using? A totally electronic hard drive, a solid state hard drive. Right. Yeah, no moving parts, needs a lot less power, um, boots faster. So you notice when you turn on your iPhone or smartphone, it comes up fairly quickly if you turn on a computer without a solid state hard drive. It takes a lot longer to turn on. These are more expensive. Um, so, I mean, and I would say almost significantly more expensive. Um, this computer has one. I chose it, but it cost me about $300 more to put this solid state hard drive in there, and the size was a lot less. So, but the performance is much better. If you buy a MacBook Air, it's got one in there, there's no option to put anything else. That's why, like, a MacBook Air is really, really small. That's how they do it, is they have the solid state hard drive in there. Right. Um, I, you know, eventually the, everything will be on a solid state hard drive. Again, like all technology, we'll start to see the new technology get more widespread and cheaper. In fact, the MacBook Airs already dropped in price, I think, right. in the last couple yeah. of weeks. So we're going to, this is going to take over and this older mechanical storage system is, is going to start to go away, which will be good in terms of reliability. Well, yeah, what was your question? To, to destroy the drive itself, yeah. the one on the left, the electronic component. A hammer will do it. Pardon me? A hammer. You could take a hammer and smash it. I did hammers and nails and everything I could do. On the one on the right? Correct. Yeah, there's only one thing that is guaranteed to do that, and it's a blowtorch. Um, yeah, you, have a blowtorch. Yeah. So, so how do you destroy the A hammer. I mean, it's a. And, and yeah, it's just electronics. It's just electronic components. You just smash it to pieces, uh, and it'll be fine. Yeah. Will I see what's inside? Because it took me, it, it was difficult. I mean, yeah, they're usually in a pretty solid case, but a big hammer. <laughs> <laughs> but literally, the, the, magne the one on the right, the magnetic heat, I mean, not just heat, flame. Flames are really the only thing that will do it. I mean, we literally. To, to test this, we've done things like throw them on a barbecue pit, uh, use a blowtorch, um, you know, those sorts of things are really, I mean, you've, you've got to physically melt the disc to make sure that it can't be retrieved. And, yeah. and, you know, that's what I, so I used to do a lot of IT work. Now mainly I do software, but we, our company used to go in and we would like replace computers and we would take them and we would wait till we had a stack of them and then we would just go out to a fire pit. I don't know if I put it on the grill because it gets pretty gnarly, but um, when you light these things on fire, they burn green and they just like all melt together. Right. And then I'm pretty sure no one could pull the data, although I bet you someone could. But <laughs> they couldn't get all the data off of that. Um, you mentioned formatting too. Some people say, oh, well, there's a, you know, I can format the drive. Um, again, first of all, the formatting that comes in the operating system, like reformat this disk, is a very, very basic level deletion program really that that's not really going to get all of the old data um, anything that's been corrupted the, I, I was I worked on a case for Harris Casino uh, several years ago uh, where Craig Ball was the discovery master and a computer went missing from the legal department and Mr. Ball did not believe that it was disappeared um, and so he tasked us with finding it and and what the company said was, well, we use old computers and we reformat them and repurpose them, so it's gone, who knows where, and even if you found it, there's no data on it. Well, we found it um, in, a, in a caddy shack of a golf course that Harris owned in Macau, um, which, you know, set Mr. Ball off right away. Why would they send it all the way around the world? Um, they had formatted, reformatted it three times. He insisted it be sent back to him because he has some forensic certifications and he was able to retrieve data from the machine that was specific to the case. Emails that were sent by the person who used the computer on the case that we were talking about after it had been formatted three times. So do not trust, I'm just gonna reformat the hard drive. That's not gonna be adequate. I mean, there's some special programs out there. What is it, the Depar Department of Defense has like a seven-step guide, you know, to yeah. getting rid of the data? Yeah. It's the easiest thing is to pull the drive out. I mean, it doesn't take any space and just 
hold on to it until you have a fire day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the other things that can plug into those slots where the, the, the RAM cards went are also some cards or boards for some of your peripherals. Um, and, and typically, or most importantly, uh, this would be your video card. Um, another way to speed up the computer is to not devote any of the power of the computer in the motherboard and the RAM itself to running the monitor, but to put extra memory on a video card and let that card run the monitor. This is more important now as we've gotten bigger, cooler, really high definition monitors, or if you're running dual monitors, you want to plug in two monitors, you want to, you want to try to off-ramp some of that onto this video card. So that's a simple question to ask too in a desktop machine. It, can I get a video card to run my monitors that has memory on that? And that'll, that'll take, again, speed things up for your computer. But you, you can't do this on a laptop. No. This is just desktop because they have the actual slots. Yep. So those are the components of these things. So what do we recommend that you buy? I mean, that's great that we've got all these individual pieces, but if you had to go out and buy one now, what do we think are the basics uh, or the specs for that? So for the desktop computer. Yeah, so if I were, I were buying a desktop computer, I would look at Lenovo, HP, um, or Dell, and we don't get any money from any of those companies and we don't really install computers, but we're happier when we see these because we know they probably work a little better than someone who just built this in his garage and then resell, resold it. So you have the option now of still getting Windows 7 Professional. I, I highly recommend you get Windows 7 Professional. Um, I found that most software, especially legal specific software, tends to work better on Windows 7. Um, RAM, so we talked about that. Four gigs would be the minimum. I would get eight if I had the option to there. So four to eight gigs of RAM. The i3 to i7 Intel processor, that's gonna be your, pretty much your option when you're, when you're specking any of them out. The i7 is faster than the i3. The i5 is a middle ground. Um, solid state drive, um, again, this might be a little overkill right now. It depends on what this computer is used for. If this computer is for your receptionist and all she's doing is answering email and, and you know, Word documents, then maybe I just get a regular hard drive. The solid state will be more expensive, but it will be faster. And, and really, and we were talking a story about this before, where someone spilled a drink into my laptop, but um, the three-year warranty. So the three-year warranty means that for three <clears> years, <throat> I can call up Dell and say, hey, my computer doesn't work. They'll do a little troubleshooting and they'll send someone to my house or to my office and they'll replace everything to get that computer working again, whether they replace the entire computer or a couple of components there. You can actually extend that out. So this laptop is actually four years old and it's still under the warranty. Um, usually costs around $150 for the three-year warranty. Um, you have the option of getting, which we've gotten before, is like there's a four-hour one depending on where you live. So like within four hours, the parts will get there. And there's like a next day as well, so the next business day, someone will show up at your office with the parts and replace everything. Um, that's really nice, you don't have to take this to a store, you don't have to call up an IT guy, like someone will just take care of it for you. Yeah, I, I highly recommend this. I mean, something, you know, if you have the computer three, four years, something's gonna go wrong with it, and it's good to have that backup. Especially a laptop. Especially, especially if your friends spill drinks. On right, it. especially yeah. your friends spill drinks on your laptops. Yeah. Um, laptop is pretty much the same, uh, you know, we put in here solid state drive. I'm going to make the assumption, especially as we move into a more cloud based environment, that the attorneys are getting laptops now um, instead of a desktop. That way it's portable. I mean, an attorney, unfortunately, is more likely to work nights and weekends, and that way they can bring everything with them instead of having to worry about synchronizing everything. Um, so we put in here a solid state hard drive. There's two things that are different from a desktop computer. The first one is a docking station. So instead of having a computer at home and a computer at work, you would have a docking station at home and a docking station at work. You would take that computer and put it in the docking station and your monitor, your printer, your keyboard and everything like that would already be plugged into the docking station. So you wouldn't have to connect all the wires all the time. Um, and it's usually elevated a little bit, which is good for the fan, because there's a fan at the bottom of this laptop, right. and it works a little better when it's elevated. Right. The most important thing, which is the last one here, is the encrypted drive. So if your office has ever gotten broken into, 
they're going to steal all the laptops. They're not going to steal any of the desktops because they don't want them, but they want the laptops. Especially if you have like a Mac, they're going to steal the Macs. No question about that. Um, if you know a laptop is portable, you could lose your luggage and your laptop's in it. You could leave it somewhere. You're traveling with it. Your hotel room could get broken into. I mean, there's just a lot more options for a laptop to get stolen. Um, back when I used to do IT, something would happen where someone's computer would crash. Like, you know, the computer crashes, it won't start, the motherboard is fried. Can you get what we need the data off this? And then, like, I'm not a forensics expert at all. I would take a screwdriver, unscrew the case, pull out the hard drive, go to Best Buy, and for 20 bucks I can buy a hard drive enclosure, click in that hard drive enclosure, and then plug it up to another computer and just browse, just like I would a flash drive. I'm like, okay, here are all the files, let's copy them over, we get into them. So we've completely bypassed the Windows password. There is no Windows password there in, in that scenario. So what you have to do is put encryption on your hard drive. So there's a couple of programs. Um, TrueCrypt is the one that I recommend because it's easy. But if you buy a new computer now, it might come with encryption built into it. But the idea here is if, if someone does that, if they just pull your hard drive out and stick it in a USB case, um, they would have to put in the password to get into that. And if they don't have their password, you can't see any data. So that's good and bad. It's bad because if you lose that password, you're not getting in there. You have to know what that password is. But it really protects your data. That's, you know, we we'll always hear on the news the government lost a computer and it had 5,000 social security numbers on it. I mean, that computer had a password on it. But they're worried about it because it wasn't encrypted. And that's the problem. TrueCrypt, again, is free, and it works on Windows and Macs. That's what I use. It's on this computer. It's on my MacBook Air. That way, if I lose my computer, I know that no one's going to be able to get into it without that encryption password. There's other options out there as well. Right. So a couple of comments I'll make about this. First of all, this is an area that is just starting to come onto the radar of bar associations. There have been one or two bar associations in other states that have started talking about taking reasonable precautions to protect client data by using encryption. Um, and, and one of the reasons, of course, is that laptops can be stolen easily and the data accessed fairly easily. If you encrypt the data, and, and all, as Craig said, all that is is a simple program that scrambles everything on there and you need the key to reopen it. So if somebody gets that computer, they can't do anything with the data. The other reason is just, just one second, let me just finish this thought while I think of it. Um, the other reason is that traditionally lawyers of all sizes, small firms, big firms, we haven't been the target of hackers. Hackers traditionally go after businesses to get information, things like, uh, what was it, Target or whoever it was right. last year that had all their, their data Target stolen. just recently. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, banks, you know, places where financial data is stored. Well, those organizations have really beefed up their security in the last year or so, and there's been a phenomenal rise just in the last eight to 10 months of hacker attacks against lawyers because they know that lawyers represent businesses and very often have business information on their law firm computers. So all of a sudden we've become, and traditionally, we don't do a whole lot of security. So that law firms have be, all of a sudden become a big target for hackers, uh, especially if you do business law, if you represent any sort of businesses. Um, and it doesn't take a very big business to have a lot of information that's useful to hackers. So uh, there was a, there's an attorney out of Florida named Ralph Losey, L-O-S-E-Y. He has a blog, and I forget what the name of it is, but he just did a two-part article on this issue because the firm he works with represents some businesses down there and some of the security things that attorneys should be aware of and, and can uh, precautions they can take. And again, that's setting off alarms at bar associations that security and encryption is something that they need to take a look at. So I think over the next 18 months or so, we're going to see this become a, a much bigger deal, uh, not just for firms, but for bar associations to take a look at it. And yes, I'm sorry, there was a question in the back.
Right. So, I mean, yeah, just to repeat the question, it's, you know, I guess really when should I install TrueCrypt and does it encrypt everything beforehand or not? And I, I ran into that same issue. I basically got scared after reading all this stuff and I was like, you know, my, my clients are attorneys and I've got their data. I have to have everything encrypted. So I, on this laptop right here, I downloaded TrueCrypt and it encrypts everything on there. So it, it doesn't just start after I install it. It encrypts the entire hard drive is encrypted. Well, I, I don't know if we're going to, it encrypted all the data that was already there. It didn't make it unreadable. So everything on this hard drive is encrypted. Okay, so I want to make sure I No, I mean, so, yeah, so, so here is the worst, right, so here's oh, the, no. here's the worst case scenario that could happen, okay, so you're installing TrueCrypt and it actually goes through and there's a process that takes about like three hours, depending on the size of your data, where it actually encrypts everything. The worst case scenario would be somehow your computer crashed, probably during that process, and I could see that could cause a data loss. The other thing I would say is just do a backup real quick of your data beforehand. I, I've put TrueCrypt on every machine, and I've never had an issue. I know people that have and never had an issue, but I could see that causing an issue. So you want to have a backup in place before you run the encryption, and it will encrypt everything. The other thing about TrueCrypt is, like, we're talking about encrypting the entire hard drive, but you can install TrueCrypt to encrypt flash drives and, and portable devices as well. So it can do pretty much anything. And again, I'm just using TrueCrypt because it's like best of breed, everyone uses it. But it, now I've noticed when you're buying newer computers, Intel, you got an Intel hard drive, they might have a encryption service on there as well. And this has become more and more prevalent. I think new Dells have their own as well. But I would, I, absolutely, I would, before you encrypt, I would get a portable hard drive, make a backup of everything, just in case. So if there is an issue, you know you've got a pristine copy of everything. Yes. Yes. You. I mean, unless you work for the NSA, um, that is absolutely true. Nope. I mean, because and, and no, there is not, and because you can't. I mean, that's the whole point of the encryption program. So I understand what you're asking. Like, can I just call up, like, tech support, and some guy's like, oh, yeah, I'll just type in password 1234, and it'll encrypt everything. Um, that does not exist because, well, I mean, I hope it doesn't exist, because they don't want, you know, the whole point is, is that I own this data, it's my data, and no one else can see it. And so when I put this password on here, I have to know what this password is. And again, that's a password, you know, I usually use some sort of password phrase, and that is stored somewhere, because, yeah, if I lose this password, the only option I have is to basically wipe the entire drive, and I'll lose everything. Well, there is one other option, which is to find a hacker who, who has the tools to go in, because there are, yeah, well, Craig jokingly said the NSA, there are unencryption programs, they're illegal to own, um, but hackers have them, and I would be willing to bet dollars to donuts some of the big forensics companies like Kroll have them. Um, so theoretically, you could find somebody who could run an unencryption program on the, on the encrypted drive with the lost password. It would, the first problem is they take forever to run. Um, but it, technically, there is a solution, not one you want to have to deal with. Um, I have a follow-up. Yeah. Now, don't get technical on me now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Does it encrypt that as well, or just what's on here? You can set it to. You can tell it to. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry, sir, you had a question? So I buy the encryption so that hackers can't steal my data. Right. If I can't get to it, I'd hire a hacker to get, a hacker. get my data. That's yeah, right. but I mean... You don't, you, you don't, uh, no. I mean, I, I'll just go in there. It's like, 
there, this isn't public. You're not going to be able to Google. This is like maybe finding a drug dealer. Uh, I mean, like, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, again, if you, you have, let, 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 let's say that, let's just go back to this is, I don't know of anyone that can uncrypt an encrypted true crypt disk out there. Let's not be naive enough to say that it couldn't possibly happen, but it's almost like the low hanging fruit here. The idea is, you know, all of these ethics opinions by the state bar say, take reasonable steps, okay? So if you were like, well, I have a computer, I installed TrueCrypt on it, I had an encrypted hard drive, and someone broke into my office and hired, you know, an ex-NSA guy to open it up. I'm not an attorney. I think you probably have taken some sort of reasonable steps to protect that data. Um, again, it's not, it's not like people are uncrypting TrueCrypt stuff. That's never been, supposedly, the, what we know is that that's never been done before. Probably has been done, but it's never been publicized. Yeah. This is not stuff that people know about or how to do. This isn't like I could go to Best Buy and talk to one of the Geek Squad guys and be like, hey, can you decrypt my TrueCrypt stuff? No, they couldn't do it. What he's saying is like a multi-billion dollar company probably has some sort of black hat team that might have the ability to do it, but never been publicized before. Um, so it would be highly, highly unlikely that that could ever happen. Again, write the password down, store it somewhere that you're never going to lose it, and then that issue won't happen. Okay. Right. Macintosh, we've mentioned them several times. There used to be uh, some real prejudice against using Macs in the law office because 10 years ago, as Craig said, before they went to the Intel chipset, things were much more proprietary. There was sort of what I think is more of a myth that software didn't, for legal didn't run on on Macs, I don't think that's really true. I mean, Word itself was was the first version of Word was published for Macintosh. Um, it, you know, it was built originally for the Apple environment. Um, the only place I saw that to be really true was in my area, which is litigation support. Some of the lit support software didn't run on Macintosh, but as Craig said, first they switched to Intel chips, which means now you can run pretty much any Windows program. Uh, either directly or using something like Parallels, which emulates Windows on the Mac. Um, but also, especially in the lit support world, we're, we're moving everything to the internet, to the cloud. Um, and, and so the operating system, the computer, is, is meaningless. As long as you can get to the internet, you, you can use pretty much any of these programs, and that's gonna be more the focus of our second problem. So I, I mean, I, you know, we, we throw this thing on here just because every now and then somebody will say, is it true I can't use a Macintosh? I mean, how many folks here have Apple's Macs, right? I mean, yeah, you know, this, this argument's pretty much gone away, but Absolutely. we always just mention it. So tablets, how many folks have tablets? Okay, that's also widespread in the legal market. iPads kind of own this market, uh, even though Windows tablets have been around longer. Um, uh, <laughs> You know, Windows just never really, the, the, the Windows guys never really developed apps the way iPad did. When, when the iPad came out, they really aggressively went after the application market and developed stuff so that pretty much everything we want to do, we can do in that, in that market. The droid market, the galaxies are starting to catch up. Um, Q1 of this year, for the first time, Macs did, or Macintosh or Apple did not have 50% or more of the tablet market. It was the first time they dropped below 50% of all tablets sold. So you're starting to see a little swing back. Um, but really, in terms of legal applications, I know most of the software and practice management, all, uh, you know, they all document have, management. They have, I, everyone has an iPad app. Yeah. Not everyone now, currently, has a Android app. I mean, if you're running a Windows tablet, you could run full version, and you're running the full version of Windows, well then you can just install the software. But let's be honest, they're all developing Android apps. At Tech Show, four companies came out with their Android apps. Yeah. So, so that'll get there. So right, I mean really, when you're picking a tablet, the first thing I would do is make a list of the stuff that I used in my office, and then find out if, if that's available on their ecosystem. That's a pretty good way to choose. Right, and again, we don't get paid by any of these folks. We just kind of monitor. Craig's an iPad guy, I'm an Android guy, it's just, you know, a lot of it's just personal taste. We don't make enough money to be a, a Windows tablet guy. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> the, the new Windows tablets, the Surface 3 just came out, the, the lowest one is $799, the 
Uh, most expensive one is $2,000. So they're a little more pricey. Yeah. Okay, so those are computers. And if you have one computer, a desktop or a laptop, that's great. But if you're in an office and you want to network, how does that work? How do you connect all of these things together? And again, we just want to talk about some of the phrases that are used so you don't get confused when people are talking to you about doing some work in, in your office or, or trying to expand your office to hook more people up. So I'm sorry, could you just go back to that? And just remember this picture, all these cables plugging into a, a bank of plugs of one sort or another. We're going to come back to this uh, concept in a second. But the first type of network, the simplest network, was what was called a peer-to-peer. -peer. That's just plugging two computers together. Just run a wire between the two computers. That was extremely easy with Macintosh because Macintosh operating systems have this built in. If you plug two Apple computers together, they look and recognize each other. They can see all the data on, on the other computer. So you basically have a simple network in the Macintosh environment just by running cables between the computers. In the Windows environment, you had to have a special software that added on. Um, it wasn't really difficult to work with, but it was a bit of a pain. But 15 years ago, when it was the only thing that was available, when, when Windows was first coming out, a lot of people used these. Good for three, four, five computers, but beyond that peer-to-peer -peer networking, it just gets too slow if you're trying to pass too much data around. So the next... This was the 90s. I don't think, you know, <laughs> After the millennium, we really didn't. See, I've never really seen these out in the native field before. Nah, you don't see them anymore. Um, what we have is what's called a local area network. So the idea here is you take all of your different computers, you store the data that you need to get at, the common data, your, your client files, maybe your calendars, whatever, and you put them on one machine called a file server or a server. And then you connect all the individual people in the office to that server. But you don't plug in directly. You use something like that first picture that we showed. All the individual computers plug into a switch or a router. You'll hear those names. Like what sort of a, do you have a five gigabit ethernet switch? Well, you know, what does that mean? That's just the speed and the definition. The idea is that you've got a central piece of equipment all the computers plug into that, and then one wire runs to the file server. Okay, so it centralizes everything. Well, this is where slowdowns can happen. Okay, if you're having slowdowns in your office and you have a, a network, the first thing you want to look at is what's this wiring look like. Um, very commonly, what will happen is you start off as a small office, you might have a switch that only has five plugs in it. So you plug your computers in, and then five more people get added. So you buy another five plug switch, and you plug those together. Okay, so you've added another wire for data to go over, which can slow things down. Also now, um, printers, anything that has a, a hard drive and a memory chip, printers, fax machines, uh, maybe even your phone system, if it's a, a voice over internet protocol, like Vonage, Right? They're using the internet to run your phones, not a, not a landline. They're going through these switches too. So all of a sudden you get a lot of data going through these things. Print signals especially will slow down the traffic. So you want a big switch that has, what's your rule of thumb, at least three plugs for every user? Yeah, three, and that's a printer phone and computer, and even if you don't have that now, you might grow you, into You that. may. So if you get five people, you want to make sure you have a 15 to 20 plug switch. The other thing is you don't want to go to Office Depot to buy this, okay? You want to buy something like a Cisco uh, HP or, or a Dell. HP or a Dell switch from them. You can go right to their websites. Uh, or if you have an IT guy, somebody who services your computers, ask them to get you one, to order one. Uh, but you want a, basically an industrial strength switch or router because it will handle more traffic, okay? It'll, it'll, it'll be faster with more throughput, and it'll, in many cases, it'll noticeably increase the, the speed of your, of your network. So again, can be called a switch, can be called a router. Um, oftentimes now, if, you're, if your internet access is through a cable company, the cable modem will have that router built into it. Um, and so you gotta make sure that you have, uh, again, a big enough switch 
to handle all the traffic that's coming through that. Okay, so this is again not something you want to do yourself. You probably want to get an IT person to at least look at it, and you can test the signal on the on the lines. He can he or she can plug in a a, a cable reader and and test what the throughput is to tell you where a how fast the throughput is and b if there's bottlenecks someplace. Okay, and sometimes it's, it can be as simple as those plugs. That, you know, they're they're just little clips that plug onto the wire. They go bad. You can, you can sometimes solve your problem by just replacing the, the wire, okay? So the next step from that, of course, is what we've used the phrase already a couple times, cloud computing, okay? We've got in the LAN setup, you've got your software and your files, everything's on your computers. Some of them may, some of the software may be on your individual computer, some of it may be on the network uh, file server, but you've got all, not just your stuff, but you've got the programs, the software, on your network as well, okay? The next iteration is to move all that stuff out to the internet, or the phrase that's used a lot is cloud computing. Now, this isn't anything new for us. How many people in this room have done research on Lexus or Westlaw? Everybody, right? Okay, you've used cloud computing, okay? I mean, if you think about it, you're accessing through your computer or through a terminal at the library someplace, uh, maybe at the Bar Association. You're going out over the internet through the wires to their databases on their computers in Egan, Minnesota or Dayton, Ohio, <clears throat> researching on their stuff. They've got it all loaded up there and then you download what you need, okay? Cloud computing. The difference now is that phrase at the bottom, SaaS, software as a service. This is another buzzword that you'll hear in software sales. All that means is the software's sitting out there on their computers, okay? And so now not just Lexus or West, it can be Word, it can be PC Law, it can be any software that you can think of now. They're selling those on their servers. You don't have to load anything, you don't have to upgrade anything. They maintain it all and you pay a monthly subscription fee to that company. We're gonna talk about that in the, in the, in the office world and, and, and email world in the second part of this presentation. But that's all we're talking about in cloud computing is moving everything, not just the data, but the software. And then there's, so of course, we've got some on our network, we've got some here, there's, there's combinations. Yeah, I mean, I think re reality of what we're gonna see is a, a hybrid network. So you're gonna have a couple of products that you keep and you have on your server and then you have and i think that's going to be like 25 percent and then you're going to have 75 percent of the other stuff you use will be hosted in the cloud um, again that way and look that 25 percent now is pretty manageable to back it up and everything like that it's not everything that you have um, but that's what we see things going to where people are saying all right we're going to take you know our email service and maybe our practice management software and we're going to put that into the cloud and we're going to keep our accounting and our billing done locally on our server here we're just going to back that server up so we're really moving to some sort of hybrid environment so you can mix and match depending upon what you already own what you want to own new things you want to buy that's all yes Well, right. So, uh, you know, I'll just to answer that very quickly, because um, we do a presentation on cloud computing and how to figure, you know, what services to use. And you are probably one of the rare people that have read those actual agreements and been like, uh oh. Um, so there's a couple of things that I, w I would look for. One of them is that you have the ability <clears throat> to back up your data on that cloud based service. I think that's huge. So I know like a, a product, Clio, that, that I deal with sometimes. Clio has this thing where, look, if, look, I think Clio is a really good product, but let's just say they became evil and it was a horrible product and they started charging me $1,000 a month for it. Well, my Clio data automatically backs up to another service, okay? So that's the question to always ask. The, the, one of the first ones is like, hey, you know, how do I back up or export all my data and can I back up and export all my data out? And if you cannot do that, um, I'd be really, really wary because, I mean, some of these 
some of these uh, cloud providers are really, really good, and some of these are like some guy in his garage with like a computer hooked up to it. But look, you know, looking through the internet, it's really easy to disguise that so that you don't know. I mean, some people are nuts that have these, and some are reputable companies. So look for that. The other thing I would look for is something, and it's real quick, and then we'll move on. But SAS 70 Type 2 certification, so that's SAS 70 Type 2 certification, and then the other thing. I'm going to add to that, and we can talk about this after the presentation, is if you're dealing, and this is, I think that we run into this all the time, and it's, it's somewhat shocking, but if you're dealing with any sort of medical records at all, um, is this service HIPAA compliant? Okay, and then we'll throw in this last one. I know I said that was the last. Um, do they somehow claim data ownership? And you have to be really careful because they might not, but then they're going to change their agreement you know, the, you know, they, you know, you always get these agreements that are 40 pages long. Like we change them, and sometimes they try to do the data ownership. But if you look for some of that, I think you can be protected. Um, but again, I can just tell you right now that the trend is most of the stuff. I mean, most of these companies that have software that you install on your computer, they're coming out with a cloud-based product. That's where the market is, is is heading. I don't think every single thing will ever go that way. I think that you will still have some stuff that you will have on your computers. You know, it's, cloud isn't going to kill the server. You know, everyone always says stuff like that. You know, we're going to change. Same thing like with email, do not kill mail, we just use it a lot less. Um, anyway, so I hope that somewhat answers that and we can talk about that afterwards. Um, the one thing that we also have to add in here, I wish we never had to talk about this again, but we have to talk about it because I run into problems all the time, is Wi-Fi network. So, again, you have a switch. Well, a switch is controlled by wires in your office, so you can, that's pretty secure. Unless someone breaks into your office and runs a switch, out, like a, a wire out your door, well, you should be able to see that. You can't see that with a Wi-Fi network. So the first thing that we have to add in here is that you have to do a couple of things. One of them is your uh, Wi-Fi router, it's a little thing with the antennas, needs to have two networks on it. One's the regular network, for everyone that works there, and the other one is the guest network, and that's where if we're having a deposition or people are coming into my office, they connect to the guest network. If you look, if you have on your computer right now, you see that you can connect to a guest network here. The guest network has no ability to browse computers in the network, okay? They can just use internet access, because you don't want anyone, especially like opposing counsel, being able to connect to your network and then browse your computers. Because let's face it, a lot of people's password are password on their computers, and if you know that, you can just blow right through it. Um, the other thing that I'll bring up about the whole Wi-Fi network and the security, and I never even thought about this before, but um, I worked with an attorney in Louisiana, and he got an ethics uh, complaint against him. The reason he got an ethics complaint was because there was a Gmail address that was set up in his name, so let's just, my name's Craig Bayer, so let's just say someone registers Craig Bayer attorney at Gmail. Anyone can do that, anyone here could do that right now if it was available. Um, they register that, and then they started emailing judges and other lawyers and attorneys and saying all sorts of horrible things, okay? So what, what they did is they went and they looked and they said, where are these emails coming from? Because we know anyone can sign up for a Gmail address. And they're like, oh, like these emails are coming from this guy's office because they tracked them back and they saw that the emails were coming from this person's office. Okay, so then they were like, okay, well this guy's sending him out there, he's crazy. And, and I was talking to this attorney, I'm like, well do you have a Wi-Fi network? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, is there a password on it? And he's like, no. And I was like, anyone that happened to fire anyone recently? Like, yes, or they were pretty pissed off? Yes. And that's what was happening. This guy was going at different times and he, he was in a, in a town and so he was going to a parking lot, parking his car, and then connecting to the Wi-Fi, and then sending all these emails out. So, I mean, really, if you don't, this is like almost like identity theft. I mean, if you don't lock this down and you let anyone connect and they do something, you're responsible for that. So you want to have what they call WEP. WEP encryption is just a password. So when I connect to the network, I have to type in a password. I have some sort of password there and have two networks a regular one and a guest, and they both have to have passwords. Okay, so real quick, this is the, the last little section here. Um, we're going to talk just briefly about math because that's how documents are stored. Remember I talked about the electromagnetic disk 
and the, the bits, okay? Um, the lowest common denominator, the lowest piece of storage on a computer is a bit. Every time the, uh, uh, the, the disk spins and that little arm sends a signal down and it creates a, a storage unit on the computer, it's a bit. And eight of those bits is a byte. So we've used the term megabytes and gigabytes. You'll hear that in, in um, describing computers. Okay, those are all accumulations of bits and bytes because the guys who write computer language use zeros and ones to create the basic computer language. That's because we use the decimal system, okay? Everything we do is based on tens, um, and, and so that's the language that they use to create these little magnetic signals and impulses that store the data. And they write these elaborate languages based on combinations of zeros and ones, all right? Now, that's kind of important. Uh, first of all, it's good for us because it's a base 10 language. The, the Babylonians used a base 20 language, um, so everything was based on combinations of 20s. Um, and the Mayans used a base 60 language, which is what I always jokingly say I'm convinced that's why the Mayans went extinct because their brains exploded trying to balance their checkbooks with a base 60 language. It's just, I can't even think about doing that. Um, but we use the, the base 10, and so you'll hear people say sometimes, um, oh, I can't produce that data because there's so much. It, it's, a, it's a 50 gigabyte file, and that's just too much. Well, what does that mean? Okay, you're, the question you should ask yourself is not how big is that file on the disk itself, but what type of data is it? Because different data is different sizes, okay? A PDF file is not the same size, uh, a 50 gigabytes of a PDF is not the same number of documents as 50 gigabytes of a Word uh, format or pictures. And the, the best illustration of this I use is um, uh, all of the written works of Shakespeare in a 12-point font, straight text, no pictures, nothing fancy, all of William Shakespeare's writings can be stored on a 5-megabyte file. 5 megabytes, extremely small file, all of Shakespeare. 5 megabytes is also just about the size of the live version of Cheeseburger in Paradise recorded at Fenway Park by Jimmy Buffett. Okay, so 5 megabytes all of Shakespeare, one song by Jimmy Buffett, okay? It's not the gigabytes, it's the file type. So that's the question that you need to answer. Just as a, as a rough reference, um, 500 gigabytes, which is kind of the average disk size these days when you buy a computer, if you just had straight text, right, just Word documents, that would be about 30 million pages or 14,500 banker boxes on one computer. Okay, straight text. Now, if that were something else, uh, uh, oh, PDF files, for example, you'd have um, far less documents because the, the, the size is greater per document. Okay, so you could do a calculation based on it. But the, the whole point is, when somebody starts throwing around gigabytes and terabytes, don't think about the size of the file. The important question is, what's the file? What file type is it? Is it a picture? Is it a sound file? Is it a word file? Is it a spreadsheet which can have multiple pages, et cetera? So, you know, don't get fooled by the, the phrase gigabyte or terabyte. That's, that's not what's really important. Okay, any quick questions? What, we're, what, what they'd like us to do here is just kind of keep on going. It's supposed to